Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat, and with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess a new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Pick it up next week. Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here at freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio, and we will be broadcasting live for the next two hours here on Studio B. And I thank all of you for taking the time to join us and fellowship this evening. I have a very interesting, intriguing, and exciting guest um, joining me for the next two hours. S. Douglas Woodward, and he's published uh, five books, I believe, up until this point, and um, is busy with many projects and endeavors, and um, I'm really intrigued by the the newest book, of which we will be focused on, but we'll, I'll get him to talk about each one of them, um, as they are all uh, connected to what we're dealing with as world and as the fig tree generation. Uh, important as far as revelation for preparing yourself and your families, your loved ones, for those things that are coming upon the world. Um, you can find his information and the different books and trailers and things that are connected to him, his blogs and his books, all found at faithhappens.com. Uh, Douglas, are you with us, brother? Hey, I am. <clears throat> it's great to be with you, Zen. Thanks for having me on. Uh, well, we appreciate you and taking the time to, to join us. And uh, as I said, I'm really intrigued by um, the last book that you are... I, I, I believe you've already published it, right? And it is available? That's right. Now, I've actually written about nine books. This one is one okay, that I great. wrote uh, and published oh, a year or so ago. And... Uh, but it's one that continues to draw a lot of attention, and and uh, and based upon our discussions and and uh, understanding of your audience, it seems like it might be one of the ones that would be the most interesting to folks. And so, um, I think it's where we where we should begin, definitely. Oh, absolutely. Um, and before we go into that, if you would um, provide just your contact information, if people were mm -hmm. to want a you know a Facebook or email address, anything of that right. nature. Yeah, I know that's... your website and all, but mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and then also please um, speak about each one of your nine books as far as uh, what you know, just general discussion, what they are about. Sure, sure. no, I'd be I appreciate the opportunity to do that. All right, all right. Uh, basic contact information. My website is uh, Faith Happens. F A I T H hyphen Happens. FaithHappens dot com. And um, my uh, web or my Facebook site is S as in Stephen S Douglas Woodward, and uh, you can also reach me uh, through an email, which is faith. You can just use Doug at faith hyphen happens dot com. That is uh, a good way to get a hold of me, and I, I'm pretty good about responding to emails. So I'd encourage your listeners to uh, feel free to ask me questions, and, and I'll do my best to get back to them here pretty quick. Um, and so, uh, so those are the different ways. You can also just search for me. Uh, you can do a search on DougWoodward.com. It'll take you to my website. If uh, all else fails and you can't remember Faith Happens, then DougWoodward.com will get you there. And uh, you can find my books uh, at Amazon, uh, S. Douglas Woodward. There's an S. Douglas Woodward store. Uh, any of the books that I've written that folks are interested in, if they'd like me to sign those books, um, that is a way to do that uh, through Amazon. Uh, all my books are on Kindle and on iBooks, on Lulu, and on Nook. And so there's electronic copies of uh, of all of them as well. Excellent. Well, how I know that you were involved and had been part of 
uh, Microsoft and were involved with you know technology mm -hmm. and and <clears throat> things of that nature. But have you always had an interest in the prophetic word and study of mythology? How is it that you came to be an author? Um, kind of. <coughs> Right. Well, I yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm a young man of 60 years old, um, and I've been uh, uh, I would say uh, in the fold, um, accepted Christ in my life probably when I was about 10 years old. Um, I'm I'm one of those guys that listened to Billy Graham on television, and uh, as a child, uh, that made sense to me to invite Christ in my life, and so I became a, a Christian a long time ago. When I was 15, I had a uh, a really nasty bout of cancer. I had a disease called rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, rhabdo is at some time shortened, and uh, it is a type of cancer that strikes adolescence. Again, I was 15 when this occurred. Ultimately, um, I lost my left leg to the disease, but uh, after lots of uh, radiation therapy, some chemotherapy, and so forth, uh, managed to pull through. It also helped that I had people praying for me all over the country um, and uh, I struck up relationships with lots of different people. And uh, But somehow, uh, I think because the Lord had a plan for me uh, that extended beyond just having cancer, that I managed to get through that. So I, I definitely believe that uh, that the Lord's hand was on me. And, um, and so uh, that was back in the year 1969. And, um, and so uh, really I, I got into, I thought I was going to go into the ministry, but things just didn't kind, kind of work out that way. I got into uh, computers, and uh, after a number of years, I eventually worked for Oracle, uh, I worked for Microsoft. Uh, it was uh, general managers for both Oracle and Microsoft. I was a partner at the large accounting firm of Ernst & Young. So I've been in business most of my career. About six years ago, five or six years ago, I started writing books. I'd studied uh, Bible prophecy. I started to say uh, I was another uh, one of those guys that was uh, captivated by in about 1970, when Hal Lindsey released the book, uh, Late Great Planet Earth, that had a big influence on my life. It kind of suggested to me that history was going somewhere. And um, and so I, I got very interested in prophecy and the prophetic word uh, at that time. So I've read, you know, not just dozens, but probably 100 books on uh, prophetic subjects through the years, as well as just studying the scripture and participating as uh, was an elder and was an associate pastor at a Methodist church for a little while before I really got into computers and uh, was an elder in the Presbyterian church, the Reformed church. And, um, but, you know, the bulk of my career really was in computers, software, internet, media, things like that. So, um, but it's in the, been in the last five or six years that I've written nine books and I've spoken at a number of conferences. I, I have appeared on television. There's quite a few. If you go out and look at YouTube and folks look under S. Douglas Woodward, they're going to see a lot of YouTubes. Uh, I've spoken on uh, at different conferences, the television show, Prophecy in the News, been on there quite a few times and uh, talked a lot about my books. So there's videos out there as well that people might like to like to look at if they, if they kind of are interested in the things that I've got to talk about. So that is another way people can get acquainted with me. Um, I uh, live in Oklahoma. I've been, I will be married next month for 40 years. Wow. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm real pleased. Thank you. Pleased about that. I have a daughter that's following in her father's footsteps. She's uh, about 36 years old, almost, and uh, is uh, at Microsoft and works there in Seattle. In fact, she's coming to visit me and has just gotten in town here just a little while ago. So after we get done talking together, I'm going to go see my daughter. She's staying over at my son's house. And so my, my second child is, uh, is a son that's uh, 31 years old. And I finally have a, uh, a grandson. Uh, his name's Brody, and he is a uh, delight. And uh, so I've, I've kind of graduated from having just grand dogs to actually having a grandchild. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. A big step up there. Yeah, a big, a big step up. Not, <laughs> not even close. So, uh, so that's a little bit about myself. My wife, Donna, is a nurse. And, and uh, again, we've been married for almost 40 years. So it's been, uh, it's been, I've been very privileged. I've worked for some great companies and, and uh, develop a lot of great relationships and, and uh, very plugged into the, the sort of the prophetic community of the writer, researchers, and speakers, and, 
and I'm really privileged to interact with a lot of folks, and and uh, so that's kind of my story. Well, that sounds like a quite an intriguing life. Um, I, I I don't know if you know anything as far as my particular story too, but uh, I acquired a disability when I was 24 years old, and I've been in a wheelchair since, and that um, ever since that time I've had a lot of space and time um, to put forth and place my focus on study of the word and mythology, ancient mysteries, and uh, Mm -hmm. to have really digested and to have um, been diligent in my research, whereas, you know, most people are so busy, so consumed as far as just trying to manage their daily lives and pay, you know, make the money to pay their bills and to keep food on the table and so a lot and of course that has been done in such a way to keep most people occupied so that they can't place their um, focus and their priority on the kingdom and that the matrix has been instilled in such a way to um, to keep um, you know the majority of the masses their focus off of God and uh, mm-hmm. the creator and creation and those things which are truly revel- uh, relevant for you know our eternal inheritance and our uh, salvation of soul and things of of that nature and so right right no exactly well you have you and I have a bit in common there I'm I'm right. a bit more mobile than you uh, but we both are going to uh, really rejoice in the kingdom. Uh, as it says, the lame shall leap, and, and you and I'll go leap together somewhere. Yeah, brother, it sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. So, uh, yeah, so so I uh, I could talk briefly about the books I've written, uh, if you'd like. Yes, and, please, um, yeah. Yeah, I started off writing a book, Are We Living in the Last Days, which was a uh, really kind of an introductory book, uh, fairly lengthy, uh, but I, I covered sort of all of the different points of view on different topics uh, related to Bible prophecy, and so uh, that's kind of how I got started. That was a good good way for me to get kind of grounded. Second book I, I wrote was pretty popular. It was called Decoding Doomsday, and really was, uh, it sort of sounds funny to say, but it was sort of a, a history of doomsday, <laughs> and sort of a history of of uh, the different theories about doomsday and the different times in, in the past where uh, people had come to the conclusion that we had arrived at the end of the world, and so I talk uh, quite a bit about that. I talk about the the prophecies, you know, from uh, prophets, prophets like Nostradamus to the prophets of the Bible, and uh, talk about what I believe is uh, is coming upon the earth. And uh, so that was the second book. Um, let's see, a third book I wrote called Black Sun, Blood Moon, which was more of a personal testimony about the meaning of prophecy to me. Um, then let's see the fourth book. Oh, uh, Power Quest book one and Power Quest book two. These are a little bit more academic studies. They're th- together. They're about 800 pages in length wow. and, and they really, uh, uh, focus on the, uh, really a, a historical, uh, understanding of the paranormal in America and how it's influenced our spiritual, uh, sort of our spiritual culture in America, and, uh, and then it moves into, book two moves into an analysis of, of sort of all of the different factors that have influenced our, our, our politics and, uh, and where I think we're going. So a lot of emphasis upon um, uh, the Nazis, uh, on mind control, which you were alluding to earlier, on eugenics. Um, I listened briefly to a program that you did with Dan Duvall, um, and uh, was it Carol? Carolyn uh, Hamlet. Yeah. Hamlet, yeah. Um, dissociative Identity Disorder, the CIA, those are all topics I talk about. The Kennedy assassination, I talk about all those in PowerQuest Book 2. Uh, it's, a, it, it's not, um, I would say that it's, it's quite readable, but it is, uh, it's lengthy, and the subjects are dark, uh, but people that are interested in getting a, a really good grasp of sort of all these different influences on America, that is a book that they might enjoy reading. Um, I took it up a notch and co-wrote a book called The Final Babylon with uh, co-authors uh, Doug Krieger and Dean McGriff. 
And the final Babylon is arguing that while there have been many Babylons in the Bible, uh, many Babylons in history, that uh, we happen to believe that we are living in the last of the last days and that the final Babylon is, is not Europe. Uh, it's not a revived Roman Empire. It's not um, uh, in Islam. It's, although Islam is a, it certainly embodies, in, in our point of view, the spirit of the Antichrist. But no, the, the final Babylon, we actually believe, is the United States. Um, and yeah, uh, more broadly, perhaps Western, um, Western Anglo-Americanism, but specifically the sort of the economic, military, political, and cultural center of the world is the United States. And so that book, The Final Babylon, has sold uh, quite well and continues to sell well. And it is a, a discussion that, that many people are finding very interesting because the uh, sort of the first line in the book, uh, and, and this is in response to the traditional scenario of, of Hal Lindsey and Grant Jeffrey and Tim LaHaye and so forth, is that Rome has not revived. And uh, so we are challenging the idea that Europe is, in fact, the, uh, the power structure of the Antichrist. We believe the power base of the Antichrist is really in the military and the economics of the United States and that the Antichrist could, in fact, be an American leader. Um, and I won't speculate too much, <laughs> at least not on the air, regarding who that leader might be. Um, but uh, uh, nevertheless, that, ha that book has been uh, quite a, a good one and has been uh, very influential. So it's still raising a lot of debate about uh, because it does take a, take a different point of view than the traditional scenario of late great planet Earth and, and really traditional prophetic teaching. So uh, And then after... Uh, that book, um, I wrote the book that we're going to talk about tonight, the book on Mars, and, um, um, and that one is really my response to the whole issue of ancient aliens, and, uh, and so we'll get into that and talk about you know, why that is, why the, the issue of Mars and in our culture has been such a, uh, an important run-up to the whole ancient alien phenomenon that has been such a big, big thing in uh, especially in the last, I'd say, what, three years, four years, uh, certainly even longer in our culture, going all the way back to uh, Chariots of the Gods with Eric Van Dyneken and, right. and all of that as well. But we'll really get into that tonight, talk about that. Uh, I've written a book called Blood Moon, which is an analysis of the whole uh, Blood Moon phenomenon. I take a more of a moderate point of view uh, than the uh, Pastor Mark Biltz and John Hagee, um, they, they are arguing that we're really upon the cusp, perhaps as early as September of 2015, for the, 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 <coughs> the 70th week of Daniel. Let me sip my coffee. And, uh, <coughs> and so they're arguing that, you know, that we may be right upon the, the final weeks or months here before the, uh, the tribulation, the so-called great tribulation, all that begins. <coughs> I apologize. Hopefully that'll go away here in a minute. Uh, and uh, yeah, go ahead. No problem. Take your time. Um, <clears throat> well, it seems to that there's a lot of disparate um, work from different people that are all pointing towards this particular time, uh, as like the Dewey Brewers, the Daniels timeline, uh, Stuart Bess and his work on the Omega Code and. And uh, there's a lot of different things, even with the uh, Revelation 12, the virgin clothed in the sun with the moon beneath her feet, a crown of 12 stars, a child within her womb, the, and how that plays out to, if, if you can look up that celestial alignment uh, with the Solarium or Starry Night, one of those programs. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and it connects to the Feast of Trumpets. 2017 and so um and then of course the tetrad moons have to you know in the way that they have all fallen on the hebraic feast days and um that is in you know significant the regathering um recreation of israel as a nation as the mm. blooming of the of the fig tree and how christ says and matthew 24 and mark 13 and luke 21 that this would be the generation that that all things would be fulfilled, you know, that we would see 
uh, the the return, the second coming, and so. Well, I agree. I think that um, the caution I've got is that uh, drawing a bead on um, this September, that that may be a little bit too specific, but my sense is that we are within perhaps a decade uh, of the return of the Lord, and so then it becomes kind of a question of uh, whether you believe in a post-tribulation, a pre-wrath, a pre-tribulation point of view, and uh, don't know, what, would you say your your listeners tend to have one particular point of view as it relates to that? I think that a lot, especially those that have done uh, a lot of research, it is pre-wrath, um, which myself, I know that in John, uh, it speaks of the last day, and I equate that as also um, lining up with the last Trump. And so, um, and, and but, you know, there's a lot of people that take different positions. Um, I personally don't believe that there are multiple <clears throat> multiple raptures and um you know and, and but according to what Christ says Jesus Christ Yeshua says and in John um I can't remember if it's John chapter 6 or what but there's several references that it says uh the last day um and so <clears throat> what what what's your position on that yeah, well, it's a boy. It has really been a, a controversial position, and and uh, Zen, I find that um, you know when I when I state my position, it usually uh, alienates about everybody because <laughs> because the the pre the pre trib people say, well, you're not you're not articulating it, you know, quite the way that we pre trib people would, and then the the pre wrath people say, well, you sound kind of pre trib to me. And, and so, you know, so I, I would, I, what I tend to say is that I, I am a pre-tribulational view uh, believer, but uh, I have to specify a number of things. I think there's a number of scriptural um, requirements that, that talk in terms of, uh, of the restrainer. Uh, who is the restrainer? There's an argument that the standard argument is that the restrainer of uh, Thessalonians is, in fact, the Holy Spirit, that until the Holy Spirit s- ceases to restrain, um, the spirit of the Antichrist will not be incarnated in a specific man of lawlessness. So I still believe that that, that restrainer is uh, is most likely the spirit of, spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. Uh-huh. Um, the concept of imminency, um, I talk in terms of imminency as is, is the, is the, the, the absolute freedom of God to come, uh, the freedom of Jesus Christ to come back at any time to gather his church. Right. I believe that, that he taught us to watch uh, at all times, uh, to watch uh, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. And so I believe that we are to be ready every day for the yes. possibility. Yes. And uh, so I, I argue that. Uh, I believe that there are uh, there is a, a restriction. I believe there is a specific period of time that really is the wrath of God as it's described in the, right. uh, certainly in the in the trumpets and the vials. Uh, I really believe it begins with the sixth seal as opposed to the first seal of Revelation. And so um, I that tends to suggest that the, the wrath of God is poured out some time in the so-called Great Tribulation, as Jesus describes it in, in Matthew 24. There are those that, that would argue that the abomination of desolation uh, and, and, the, and, and all of the tribulation of Matthew 24 relates, to, of course, to the, to the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in uh, 67 to 70 A.D. during those wars. Um, I believe that that was fulfilled in part in that period of time, but I believe there is a future fulfillment as well. I agree. And yeah, and so uh, uh, so I, I I argue that all both uh, pre-trib and pre-wrath believers are are really pre-wrath in the sense that right. there is a, a wrath of God that is coming, and that believers will not go through that period of time. Um, post-tribs believe that we will be uh, those of us that are believers will will endure into the end and we will be here during the wrath of God but we will somehow be protected and uh, and you know I, I think that's a possibility but that's not what I believe so um, uh, so the rapture is very controversial um, 
and um, I, I tend to, to argue that uh, we are under a mandate to watch at all times, and, uh, and so that's really the key thing, and there are some logical arguments that suggest that perhaps we shouldn't be watching for the Antichrist as much as we should be watching for Christ, and if the Antichrist has to come before Christ comes for his church, then you know that would tend to suggest that it's not possible uh, for there to be a, a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, but, you know, my, my view is that we are to watch for Christ. And so uh, I see that as the blessed hope of the church. And uh, trying to systematize that, you know, it gets, in, it gets into some fairly detailed arguments. But uh, I believe in the imminency. And I, I believe in, uh, you know, again, I think one of the, the primary ingredients or, or uh, factors that influence and, and really are part of the pre-tribulation point of view. So, uh, and of course, with that, I'll make some enemies out there. <laughs> So. Yeah, well, you can't please everybody, and you have to go no. with where you feel. But I'm, I'm like you. I feel that we should be perpetually ready, mm -hmm. uh, and that we should have our house in order. And like the wise version, uh, virgins, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. have our wicks trimmed and our oil ready, and um, and and to be awaiting the bridegroom. So that's uh, right. Yeah. So, but um, all right. Um, I have a, a question from the chat room as to have you read or have you studied the about the Nag Hammadi codices and also I'll uh, elaborate on that have you also and do you include in your studies uh, like the pseudepigrapha the apocrypha the extra biblical mm -hmm. extra canonical texts uh, mm -hmm. you know books of Enoch that kind of thing right well, the Nag Hammadi texts, the um, uh, you know, obviously the things that really deal with Gnosticism, what was discovered, I believe, in what 1947 by Muhammad Ali, <laughs> not the Muhammad Ali we think of in America, uh -huh. but uh, another a tribesman in Egypt. Uh, that is Muhammad Ali. Um, <laughs> I'm familiar with it. I certainly have uh, have read the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, uh, the Gospel of, of Mary. Uh, there's really a, a slew of books that right. were included, of course, in that. And uh, so I'm very familiar with it. The, uh, the whole issue of the Orthodox Christian point of view versus the Gnostic point of view, I'm, uh, I'm pretty hardcore about the Orthodox point of view. I've, I've read a lot of uh, Bart Ehrman's books, uh, Elaine Pagels. I've read some of her material as well and, and tend to be very, uh, very much opposed to their perspective. All right. Hold on, Douglas. We'll be right back. Hey. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, Doug, I have a question from Doc Koo in the chat room. He wanted to ask you what your view was on Prince William and his connections to being possible Antichrist, or if you knew anything uh, about that. Right. Well, there's a, uh, my friend Jim Fletcher had written a book. I can't quite remember the exact title, but it was something like... Uh, you know, having tea with uh, with the Antichrist or something like that, where he argues that the heraldry of the the King of England um, is in fact a sort of a testimony to um, the King being the Antichrist. <coughs> and um, Prince William, I find it interesting that that he was born on the summer solstice, and right. uh, he will be thirty three years old here in a year or two, and. Um, <coughs> I'm gonna have to get up and get a get a mint or something here in a minute. But sure, sure. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I, uh, I'm fascinated by the possibility that you know that he is uh, certainly one of the with the potential candidates. Um, uh, others say, well, no, maybe it's maybe Prince Charles is not going to relinquish the uh, the throne, and so. But it's a possibility, and and uh, you know William is very a very appealing, very attractive uh, personality, a handsome guy, and so forth. And so uh, you know, I'd say uh, those that are are keeping an eye out for possible candidates for the Antichrist, he could be one. Um, no reflection on his character that I know of, but uh, nevertheless, yeah, there's there's some reasons to suspect that. Yeah, my friend Dr. Joy, she's written uh, a book on um, and has included in her work um, a lot of speculation along that line as well. But um, let's go ahead and get into 
your latest book. If you would, set the premise for us and then tell us how it is uh, that you got interested and involved in writing about it. And then um, tell us ab ab about Mars and its connections with the ancient aliens. All right. Well, of course, there's there's a lot there. Um, I guess yes. first off, the the uh, the interest I, I I developed for it began with the awareness of just sort of the crazy interest in ancient aliens, and um, as I began to study that and uh, contemplate that, I'd always been interested in the planet Mars, and really, the planet Mars is the is the only planet that we anticipate that we could actually land on, potentially colonize. And, um, and so it's, it's consequently, it has preoccupied our space program really since the 1960s. And, uh, and then there's been uh, kind of no end of speculation on Cydonia of Mars, the face on Mars. And so there's been a lot of people that have, have wondered whether or not there's uh, an ancient history. And by ancient, I mean something that could have been a million years ago, that um, perhaps there was some form of life on the planet Mars. Um, and then there are those um, like Richard Hoagland, who had popularized the, the concept of Mars as where the human race began. And uh, with the latest uh, pictures from uh, the Martian, the Mars rover, and um, there had been a lot of uh, speculation about whether or not we were seeing pictures of artifacts on the planet Mars. And so I began to dig in because I was just really intrigued by this. Um, I came across one particular book, book that was written uh, by uh, uh, Clyde Prince and um, let's see, that's right, or is it? Yeah, Clyde Prince and Lynn Picknett, and uh, <clears throat> and talking about um, uh, Mars. Let me. I'll grab the title here in a second because it's uh, it's not too far away from me. Um, but the their book on Mars. Uh, they had written a book on Mars just before the year two thousand, the Y two K phenomenon, and um, and they had uh, has seen had seen that as a kind of a red letter day a uh, kind of a crescendo to a number of things that have been going on at that time with the speculation that uh, ancient uh, civilizations that there was some con you know connection between the pyramids uh, at Giza and the pyramids on Mars um, there are a number of others Graham Hancock had written uh, a book uh, called The Monuments of Mars and once again he speculated on the same things um, and there sort of was a coalescence of a number of authors that had written on this uh, this topic, and uh, it really got me intrigued. And so as I dug into it, um, what I discovered was that there was a pretty good reason to believe that our culture's interest in the planet Mars, which goes back, uh, at least in modern times, it goes back to about 1875, that uh, that this was really a kind of a process of indoctrination to begin to get the culture ready for the notion of ancient aliens, what I call the gospel of E.T. or extraterrestrials, which as ancient alien theory um, talks about on the History Channel, that uh, the, the view is that uh, the, the gods of the ancient religious books these gods were in fact extraterrestrials and that they had visited Earth in times past and that they had been nurturing the human race. And, uh, and so I, I really decided it was important to study specifically uh, the concept of Mars. And uh, as I dug into Richard Hoagland and became more familiar with his argument that before we were Earthlings, we were Martians, um, uh, and given Hoagland's background and the following that he has had, um, I thought, well, that's really where I, I need to begin. I need to begin to study that, his point of view. And, um, and of course, he had, uh, had written uh, one of the, the primary books. Let me, jump to, uh, let me jump to that here, see if I can find it. And, uh, and that's where my, my study kind of began. And I had come across other books, um, come across uh, Nick Redfern, 
Oh, by the way, the the name of the book with uh, Picnet and Prince is is called The Stargate Conspiracy, Uh, The Truths About Extraterrestrial Life and the Mysteries of Ancient Egypt. And so they were, again, exploring this, you know, is there really a connection between Egypt and Mars, specifically the pyramids of of Egypt, the pyramids of Mars? Um, Hoagland, and I began to read a book called uh, Dark Mission by Richard Hoagland and Mike Barra. And um, and in this, they they argue that there uh, has been a contest, a battle between the Freemasons and Nazis that had come to America through Operation Paperclip, and that these two factions had come to a conflict inside of NASA. And as most uh, of your listeners will will recognize, a guy named Werner von Braun. Had uh, had been a Nazi, had been in the SS. He was responsible for the German rocket program, not by himself, but he was really kind of the focal point, uh, the iconic figure of that. And um, uh, over about a ten-year period, he worked himself up in into the position where he was the head of NASA. And by the time that we were landing on the moon, um, Hoagland was the head of NASA, <clears throat> and so. We had here a uh, uh, at one time a, a very definite Nazi that had been brought across from Germany to the United States along with his entire rocket team from Pinemunde, which was the German manufacturing and research plant uh, near the Baltic Sea uh, in North Germany. This entire group had come to the United States. There were other rocket scientists that were more or less captured by the Russians and, uh, uh, and, and obviously went back to the Soviet Union. But you really had, in effect, the space race was between Nazi rocket scientists that were in the United States and Nazi rocket scientists that were in the Soviet Union. And, uh, and, and so the sort of backdrop to this whole theme was, um, you know, what in the world are so many Nazis doing in the United States and how did they get here and what's their ultimate purpose? Well, anyway, Hoagland and Barra in Dark Mission argue that um, there were two competing factions, the Freemasons and the Nazis, and that they were vying for control of the space program because they really had – a, uh, a hidden agenda in regards to what they were trying to accomplish on the moon landings and ultimately what they wanted to accomplish in space exploration. And to make a long story short, what they were trying to accomplish was to prove the hypothesis that extraterrestrials have uh, had come into our solar system uh, perhaps a million years ago, that they had sort of like the the movie 2001 a space odyssey they had uh had left artifacts of some significance on our moon and on mars and uh, and so there has been really uh since hoagland first began to popularize this with with his books um it, you know it's become just a very very significant part of our culture and um, a lot of people would call it pseudoscience, and I suppose that's not a, uh, you know, that's not unfair to say that. But um, it's been a, a dominant, uh, dom- dominant theme. And so, what I've done, apologize, my dogs have decided to bark here in the background. No <laughs> so hopefully you can hear me better than my dog. Uh, but um, what I do in, in a lot of chapters here in the book, how many chapters do I have? Let's see, probably about 15, 16, 17. I go through and look at all kinds of issues associated with Mars, the occult, and the connections between the occult and the planet Mars. And, uh, and then really establish that it's the, again, as I said kind of at the outset, it's the uh, – the fact that our culture had really gotten just so intrigued with Mars, and by really by the year of uh, year 1900, 1901, um, it was common belief that there, of course, there was extraterrestrial life. There was life on Mars, and and not only that, but it was intelligent life, and and they were even human, and uh, and so uh, <laughs> it, it it really becomes a just a fascinating story of how intrigued we've become, and and uh, and then as I said, it it really begins to uh, it, sh- it it shows off the fact that there was a a very tight connection between uh, Mars and our speculations about Mars, about science fiction, 
and uh, and then the occult. And so all of these things are really tied together. There was a particular science fiction writer, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, who had written in the 1920s, really didn't become popular until the 19, late 1930s, 1940s, sort of po- posthumously after his death. And uh, But a lot of Lovecraft's stories, the cult of Cthulhu, um, the mountains uh, of Mars, things like that, are stories that really tie into the ancient alien themes. And, uh, and so it really gets right in the heart of some of the mythologies associated with uh, Madame Blavatsky, Theosophy, and uh, a number of other things. So it's, uh, it, it really is a, it's kind of the jumping off point for so many of these issues. And we can, we can kind of dig in and talk about a lot of these is, if you'd like. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do, and I want to actually mention two things to you. Um, have you heard Rush Limbaugh and that whole rant that he had on the, the Gore Report? No, I haven't. What, what did he tell us? Oh, it's fascinating. Um, I'll actually I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit to you and then mm-hmm. get you to comment on it. Oh, let me pull it up. Well, anyways, just, he talks about it's a seven-minute segment on one of his um, radio programs where he's talking about NASA and about how they had um, discovered life and him being a, a, you know, a high-level a media person that he has uh, access. He's seen a highly classified report um, called this Gore Report, and he talks about uh, life on Mars. And I'll just read an excerpt for you, and then mm. it should come. And he says, uh, uh, "There was life on Mars. That's what NASA is not being up front. There was life. Everybody knows it. We can't be the only people occupying the universe. It's impossible." Who do we think we are? The only people God created? Sorry for those of you who don't believe in God, only people who evolved from apes. So it's clear that there was life elsewhere, and now that NASA has kind of let the cat out of the bag, if there were habitable conditions up there, we know there was life there. In fact, they found some DNA evidence up there that compares favorably to members of the Skull and Bone Society here (laughs) on Earth. (laughs) <laughs> These people were highly industrialized, the Martians. They were technologically superior, and they were very arrogant people, and they thought that the power and the force of their existence was all that was needed to sustain them. And they didn't care a whit about the conservation. They didn't care a whit about preserving anything. They got rid of everything that was pristine. Uh, I'm going to skip just a little bit further down they had rainforests. You don't hear about this. They had ancient rainforests. They had jungles. They had so much oil and gas, they had reserves out the wazoo. Uh, in fact, one of the things they found on Mars is that it's possible that there's still some there. Tiny little amounts, but it's clear you saw the pictures from Mars. I saw the skeletons. At least I saw the fossils of the skeletons. There were people there, or there were beings there, but it looked like Pompeii, it looked like these people all died, huddled together, and it was just swarmed And in an instant. Um, you know, there was one day they were here, and then they were gone. I'll skip just a little bit more, and then I'll get you to comment on this. Okay. Uh, but the elites got off. The elites were able to travel in space. They weren't very many of them, but they were able to get off. They fled the planet in time. The stunning thing about the Mars report, the Gore report, is that they're here. These people that destroyed Mars are here. They are on Earth, folks. They are in America. They work at Halliburton. They work at Enron. They work at WorldCom. They're at Boeing. They came to America, and the Gore report clearly illustrates they have not learned a thing from their experience on Mars. Well, you know, I can't, I can't decide whether he's attempting to be serious, right. or whether he's somehow using the whole issue of Mars as a uh, as a means to um, uh, talk about, per, you know, his view of the uh, sort of ridiculous nature mm-hmm. of uh, ecology, the green movement, climate change, etc. So it's a little bit hard to uh, to know whether he's he's speaking tongue in cheek or whether he's speaking and trying to be serious. Right. Um, and, and the reason is, of course, there are uh, some folks that would, would basically say 
almost exactly the same thing that he was said, but they'd be perhaps a little bit less uh, sarcastic sounding, a bit more serious. And um, now the reality is that the I've looked a lot at the photographic evidence and the photographic evidence to me there there is limited limited number of photos that really raise some questions about whether there might have been uh, an ancient civilization on Mars. Uh, we'd almost have to go and examine sort of you know those photos you know one by one, but and talk about some of the 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 really phenomenal uh, things elements that are in the Cydonia plain. Um, oh, you know, I wanted to ask you about yeah. this too, um, real quick before I forget. Sure. Um, have you seen how they, the area around Glastonbury, England, the, yes. the street layout, it's exactly like the Cydonia layout. And so whoever had built the Tholus and the DNM and all that on Cydonia uh, in, on Mars seems to have been the people uh, that had constructed the Glastonbury area here in in England. Yeah, that that is in fact uh, one of the things I was referring to, is that the the issue of Silbury Hill, the Tholus, um, the the road structure, and so forth. Uh, I do talk about that. There are some just absolutely remarkable uh, <laughs> geographical. Uh, comparisons i need to find some of these uh some of these references so i can share some links with people so i'll kind of uh, go dig into that while we're talking but yeah i i am familiar with that um it's an area that uh david flynn the late david flynn right uh, you're probably familiar with david flynn i don't know if, mm-hmm. if a lot of your listeners are but he passed away a few years ago but he had written a book on cydonia and it was, you know, his considered opinion, uh, which I talk about in the book, that there there was a connection in ancient human history from, let's say, perhaps anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 years ago. He has a, a perhaps a different timeline than most, uh, we'll say, conservative evangelicals would have regarding the flood of Noah. So he tends to believe the flood of Noah may have been closer to 10,000 B.C. versus uh, roughly 2,500 B.C., which is where sort of the uh, uh, the sort of traditional particular view is about, or uh, yeah, specific view about the timing of uh, of the of the flood of Noah. But um, <clears throat> anyway, David Flynn gets into the discussion of the Greek mystery religions. And um, uh, in those mystery religions, he um, he points out the comparisons between uh, Cydonia, the Cydonius uh, fruit, the the quince, the five uh, five part fruit, which of course sort of is suggestive of a pentagram, and that it was the quince, which is more of a golden pear like shaped fruit that was um, very likely to be the, the fruit of the, you know, of Adam and Eve fame. It was, uh, it was the quince that was the, tempted, the tempting fruit uh, that the talking snake talked to Eve about in the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and so uh, Flynn does some, uh, some really phenomenal work in, uh, in that regard that I find very, very intriguing. So... Um, uh, I apologize. I'm not able to jump and find some of these links as quickly as I'd like to. Uh, you'll be yeah. fine because we've got a break in about three minutes and it's oh, good. Or okay. five minutes, so you'll have plenty of time. I'll have some time then to kind of grab a yeah. couple of these and, and point out where people can go look as we're talking and look out on the uh, out on the internet. So now that would be great. Right, and um, there's another thing as far as um, the revelation that. Arizona Wilder, she brings out and talks about, which is similar to what um, what Rush talked about in that rant. And whether he's spoofing or not, it, there's some connections to um, what he says and what the speculation is. All right, we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, for second hour. I'm your host, 
Zen Garcia, and I have as guests with me S. Douglas Woodward. Uh, his website is faithhappens.com, and he's the author of nine books. Um, and has we're talking about his latest book, The Lying Wonders of the Red Planet. And um, very intriguing topic. I know that the listening audience has uh, a great interest in this area of esoteric um, and knowledge and connection with the fallen angels, the strong delusion, um, and, and all things you know that are lined up um, that are connected to this. And, and I definitely think that book that David Flynn wrote on Cydonia, it's a hard one to find, but I, I do believe they reprinted it, and so it's... Um, um, it's made it more accessible, but it's a fascinating read, and I do recommend it to anybody that uh, has any kind of an interest in this particular topic. I do want to remind the listening audience just really quick that uh, Revolution Radio is the largest listener-supported, commercial-free, and corporate-free entity on the Internet and on the planet, and that we do need your monetary support in order to uh, continue being a platform for truth, to be able to talk unbiased on all the things that we speak on in connections to the matrix, uh, current events, um, the New World Order, the conspiratorial side of things, uh, which, um, you know, I appreciate your work, Douglas, because... Uh, you also are aware of the conspiratorial side of, um, you know, like government-sponsored terror, the controlled opposition, um, the way that um, the the powers, the principalities, the rulers of darkness use that controlled opposition in order to drive an agenda, uh, specifically, mm. you know, the New World Order, and that even though most think it's about... Um, global rule and world government it's it's mostly about exalting themselves and becoming as gods themselves and stealing the worship um you know the whole strong delusion of of getting the whole world to believe that they are our creators yeah absolutely i uh, i have studied that the the book i wrote power quest book 2 um really is uh, is focused on um, the the nature of the elite and their influence upon America, um, and so many of the different uh, areas that we've seen that uh, sort of come to come to pass. Specifically, eugenics. I do a pretty extensive study on eugenics and uh, and, and kind of how it bridges into transhumanism today, and uh, have done a number of talks on that. Uh, folks, that go to my website. We'll see some articles on those subjects, <clears throat> and uh, you're welcome to look at my PowerPoints. Uh, they're under a password protection. I'm happy to share it. Uh, it's just the password is just the word Jerusalem, the city Jerusalem, uh, all lowercase. And uh, so you'll see uh, presentations on, on these subjects and uh, quite a bit of information that's just available out there, a few articles, uh, sections from uh, PowerQuest Book 2. And so, yeah, I definitely have written extensively on, on these things. I don't believe in every conspiracy theory, but I, I do happen to believe that America is the primary catalyst to drive forward the, the concept of the New World Order, which is very definitely a Western, uh, uh, Western program of the elite in uh, England, the United States, to, to a lesser extent Western Europe and Japan. But it is uh, it is sort of a dominant aspect of of what is uh, sort of driving the the political, military, uh, economic program that is uh, is really uh, you know the dominant aspect of uh, what's happening in the world today. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and the thing to to really recognize is that um, even though the politics and all the dog and pony sh pony show of it uh, is what the world is focused on. Uh, this is a, a spiritual war. This is a battle of good and evil, light and darkness, and um, and those forces are 
even though so many deny that there's a, a Satan or a, a Lucifer, a, a fallen cherub, a, a rebel angel, um, and m many also deny Christ, you know, the, um, say that he's an ascended master or or even God, you know, the, there's so many now that um, are embracing these various pagan religions and the whole uh, pantheon, they they are now worshipping a pantheon of olden gods, you know, the whole Druidism and, you know, the... Uh, mm -hmm. the the whole nationalist um, uh, digging back into our past and all these ancient pagan religions. The world is ripe for uh, what the Bible terms as the, the strong delusion. And so um, if you would, can you talk about that in connection to your research and um, present some, some things that you think you, that we should know that uh, are some of the intriguing aspects of, of what mm -hmm. you've looked into. Well, certainly. Um, one thing I'll point out that in the chat room, um, I've listed a number of the links that we were talking about earlier. Uh, Watcher's Vault, David Flynn talked about, there's a specific uh, link that goes into in detail about the Silbury Hill, Avonbury, Avonbury Circle, and the connections, the 19.47 degree connection parallel between um, the structures on Mars and the structures in, in England, which is really right in the, the heart of where the crop circles are and so forth. So uh, there's a, a pretty extensive article there, probably equivalent of about four pages, a lot of photographs. And uh, this was done by David Percy back in 1995. So it's been around for quite some time. But it's, uh, it's a pretty fascinating study. So I wanted to point, point that out. And that those links are in the, the chat room. So folks that want to uh, do a little bit more research on their own. Uh, the links have been uh, have been provided. Um, let's see. In terms of of the the discussion about uh, kind of the global conspiracy, um, certainly the the notion of of new world order that itself is a phrase that's been around and been used by a number of people. Uh, Adolf Hitler talked about a new world order. So did Franklin Roosevelt. Um, we know that uh, um, you know, his vice president, Henry Wallace, uh, got the idea of, of putting um, the notion of, uh, of new world order on the back of the dollar bill, uh, Nova Ordum Seclorum, and uh, a number of other uh, sort of Latin phrases, really part of the symbolism that was put on the back of the $1 bill, the, the great seal of the United States, et cetera. So these are not new things. These are things that have been pointed out by Chris Pinto, a filmmaker, and Tom Horn in his book, um, uh, Apollyon Rising 2012. So certainly believe that that book is, uh, is very, very important. Um, <clears throat> I think that in, in terms of understanding the agenda for America, there's, a, there's really a lot of sources and they're not necessarily just Christian sources. There's, there have been quite a number of, of, uh, of scholars, uh, geopolitical uh, consultants, academics that have talked about what is it that America is really up to. Uh, I just came across a new book today. Uh, let's see if I can find the, uh, the title for it here in a second. But I think it's called World Power or something like that. But it's really looking at um, you know, what is it that America is trying to accomplish in the world. Um, but there have been, you know, no shortage. David Rockefeller, certainly, the um, you know the Rockefellers, their influence in the United Nations, the original League of Nations, the the notion of <clears throat> of trying to create a single world government in order to reduce the probability of uh, of warfare. Um, of course, those of us that look at it from a, a biblical worldview. We we see it as a uh, as truly a a conspiracy. H. G. Wells called it an open conspiracy, but it is a conspiracy in effect of the the elites, those that believe that they are smarter than the rest of us, attempting to control uh, what happens in the world, and uh, and from their standpoint, to keep the uh, the the masses. Uh, under the thumb of the intellectuals, the elites, and the the wealthy and the powerful, and it's their view that they would create a better world. But as you point to, Zen, there are certainly no shortage of individuals that are within that, perhaps a subset 
sometimes known as the Illuminati, that are um, sort of the creme de la creme, a subcommittee, if you will, uh, that that appear to have had a a plan. Uh, Manley P. Hall, who was the primary historian for uh, Freemasonry, talked about the secret destiny of America. And it's it's been a, a kind of a published plan, the great work, as the Freemasons called it, to see in America the um, the catalyst to bring about a uh, a, a a world uh, in which reason instead of dogma, in which uh, a representative democracy, at least that's what they would say, as opposed to a priesthood. Um, a repudiation of the traditional structures in Europe, that really was what the American experiment was meant to be, that it was no longer to be run, a, a, a nation run by the priesthood or by the monarchy, but it would be run by intellectuals, by individuals that were motivated by the principles of, uh, of republicanism. And by that, I don't mean the Republican Party. I mean Jeffersonian republicanism. And um, that that would be the best form of government. <clears throat> and so that really, those really were the, the founding principles upon which the nation was built. Not so much a Christian nation, but a nation freed from the tyranny of a sort of ruling class, whether that ruling class was the monarchy or it was the priesthood and the Catholic Church. But that really was the impetus for the American Revolution. Now you kind of come fast forward uh, a couple of hundred years and you ask, what is the role of America today? And, you know, America is without question the, the world's leading military power. It has at any given time, you know, either slightly below or slightly above a thousand military bases around the world. America has had, has become at the in the 21st century and really at the second half of the 20th century was the um, the ruling empire the same way the British had been uh, throughout the 19th century. And uh, the sort of like there used to be a, a rule that uh, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Well, in, in the world today, the sun never sets on the American Empire. <clears throat> the United States is the, is the dominant military power. There's never been a military power as, as strong as the United States. That does not mean that it's, that it's well um, structured to deal with counterinsurgencies. Uh, it's not necessarily well structured to deal with al-Qaeda. Um, and it's reluctant to get in, involved in wars such as with ISIS, as we've seen. Um, you know, America has, though, been the police of, uh, of globalism. It really has been with Woodrow Wilson, with FDR, and really with every American president in this century. Only Ronald Reagan was probably reticent to get too involved in, in a sort of uh, being the catalyst the police, uh, the enforcer of the, the new world order. It's been virtually every American, every American president that has been attempting to try to make the new world order come to pass. Now, just in the last very few years, <clears throat> we've seen some pushback from Russia and from China who aren't so sure they want to go along with the notion of a new world order. And uh, Henry Kissinger just recently published a book called World Order in which he talks about the uh, sort of the ideal. He goes back all the way to I think it's like 1648, talks about the Treaty of Westphalia. And it was a treaty that was to end essentially a, a century of war in Europe, but it was based upon the concept of a negotiated settlement that that allowed or it said that all governments should be able to establish a government that reflects the aspirations of their people uh, and that other governments surrounding them should not interfere in those nation states. And, <clears throat> and so um, Kissinger sort of wraps this blanket of, uh, of, of uh, idealism around himself and says that that's really what America and the West has been trying to do is it's been trying to create, it's been trying to create this type of world order um, but, of course, those in the third world would say, well, but America really has been trying through the CIA and through economics and through the World Bank, and through the Inter International Monetary Fund. It's been attempting to exert 
uh, its will upon all of the world, <clears throat> and that at the heart of uh, of the power structures of the world, you really have the economic power of Wall Street and the city of London, which is the financial district in, in London, and that essentially the world has been managed or attempt to be run and controlled by Anglo-Americanism for about 300 years. And, um, and so that's sort of the historical backdrop that I believe Americans should understand. It's not that our form of government uh, as it was certainly as it was set up by the founders is is wrong that we be should looking we should be looking instead for some sort of a socialism that 's not at all what i 'm saying what i 'm saying is that America by and large is not living up to the concepts of uh, the constitution of what our nation in, was intended to be, and instead it has become <clears throat> sort of out of control uh, empowered by elites are uh, basically in the West predominantly and uh, is attempting to enforce a world that's not so much safe from democracy or safe for democracy, but it's really, it's really safe for the, the, the bankers, the international bankers and those, uh, the wealthy that would like to continue to be wealthy and uh, dominate corporations, dominate international banks and have have been running the show for the better part of uh, the last 100 years and indirectly uh less so for at least 200 years. So, if that's that's a lot to say, but that, you know, to answer your question, those are some of the key things that Americans should know. Uh-huh. Well, let's uh go into what you see coming uh on the forefront and also uh with, you know, the um the prophecy of the last popes, the rise of the Antichrist, uh, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the prophecy of the popes, uh, a friend of mine, Chris Putnam, and another friend, Tom Horn, uh, wrote Petros Hermanos, and they have a, a specific view that the, the prophecy of St. Malachi, um, who was an Irish priest and essentially a bishop in Ireland, that when he went to Rome, and I believe it was in the 13th, perhaps in the second, in the 12th century, that he had a vision, and of course he saw. Um, uh, I think it was something like um, I forget how many. It was like 200 popes uh, from that point forward uh, to a final pope, who would be called Peter the Roman, and it was this last pope that would be the pope when Jesus Christ came back, and the church would be. Uh, the Catholic Church would be uh, apostate at that time, and um, and Rome would even be, according to some, would be destroyed. So the um, uh, the view is that uh, Pope John uh, Paul the First, Pope John Paul the uh, Second, Benedict the Sixteenth, that all of these popes uh, fit, uh, as do we can go back and look at uh, Pope Paul and Pope John, and kind of go all the way back and look at these little little verses, uh, usually two to four lines of, of a verse that were the prophecy of St. Malachi, and that these, these tend to map without too much imagination to the identity of each of the popes. And again, the according to the prophecy of St. Malachi, the current pope, uh, Francis I, would be the last pope, and it would be during his uh, time that Jesus Christ would return. And, of course, that's, you know, that's speculative, and it's, it's, in, it's really intriguing. Uh, Putnam and Horn had actually accurately identified that Benedict XVI was going to resign. He was going to be the first pope in hundreds of years to actually resign the office. And uh, they, in fact, were right within just a few months of their prediction. And, um, and the fact that Francis I is, has been elected the pope, that he is a Jesuit, um, and that the Jesuits have been sort of the intellectual arm, and many Catholics would say have been sort of the, uh, uh, you know, sort of the black sheep of the, of the Roman priesthood, uh, the monast you know, the uh, monastic order and so forth for um, some time. They've been in place for several hundred years. But uh, a, a lot of Catholics are not in favor of uh, the, the, the meaning of the Jesuits and what they have done. And, uh, and so there's a lot of skepticism regarding 
what it is that that ultimately is uh, is Francis the First's agenda. Having said that, there's a lot of popular outpouring of love and affection for this pope, and um, but it is intriguing to 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 wonder: is this guy, is this pope, in fact, the last pope uh, before Christ comes? Is the prophecy of Saint Malachi, in fact? Um, a prophecy that should be believed in. It certainly is not a, a biblical prophecy, but it is uh, a prophecy that seems to show evidence that it there's something to it. I personally have taken the view in the book I wrote, Decoding Doomsday, <clears throat> where I, I speculate uh, based upon the publishing of the prophecy in 1595 that it's very likely that the prophecy was actually written by Nostradamus, um, uh-huh. who, uh, who died in 1567, and he was, he was very fascinated by uh, the papacy, and he was um, very interested, may in fact have, have done, may have done a, a watercolor book that, uh, where he lays out different pictures of, of uh, the, different ro- the different popes and so forth. And so it's very conceivable that it was Nostradamus that actually used St. Malachi as a pseudonym, more or less, and uh, put his words in, in the, uh, you know, St. Malachi had died 400 years before him or 300 years before him. And so that's my personal speculation is that it may have been Nostradamus, but I would just say that it it bears close scrutiny because whether it was Nostradamus or it was St. Malachi, um, the pattern, and you, one can go to Wikipedia, by the way, and look this up, look up St. Malachi's prophecy or the prophecy of the popes, and you can kind of look at the mapping of each of the popes to these little couplets or verses uh, in the St. Malachi prophecy. And for those really interested, then I'd say, well, you need to get a copy of Petros Romanos. So, right. um, so it's definitely an intriguing prophecy and, and bears watching. Right. Um, so how do you see, like, what are you looking for? And do you believe that Francis is the, the, the false prophet and that, you know, that the, he'll be introducing the antichrist at some point? And, um, uh, what are the signs, the harbingers that you're looking for, you know, as we right. are recognizing the the season? Right. Well, you know, I'd say that um, I'm not a Catholic, obviously, and um, and I am not in favor of uh, you know the concept of of really of the papal uh, hierarchical structure at all. Um, I there's there's aspects of the Catholic Church that are uh, admirable, but theologically, it's it's very different than Reformation theology and evangelical theology. And I sort of class myself, you know, in in the in that uh, regard, uh, theologically, I'm very much more uh, akin and and uh, uh, in the same camp as a Martin Luther or John Calvin than I am, uh, you know, Francis the First or Saint Benedict or right. any of the Catholics, right? So um, so I'm very skeptical uh, about that. Uh, I think it's conceivable. I don't know that there's that there's any real evidence or proof yet, other than the uh, the concern I have. That's probably the most relevant concern is is the issue of unification. There's a lot of talk about unity and uh, a willingness to sacrifice truth in order to bring unity. The movement of the charismatic leadership to find unity with the Catholic Church that's an ongoing issue, and that that really concerns me. Uh, hold that thought. We'll be right back for final segment. All right, welcome back for final segment. Um, I want to read this paragraph for you, uh, Douglas, and then we'll go back into commentary on your last book and mm-hmm. uh, the focus on Mars. Uh, this is just a, a, a Q&A with David Icke, which I, I certainly don't, um, you know, endorse him as a, but he does have a lot of intriguing revelations, but I do mm. believe yes. that he's part of a, a establishment. Um, but anyways, he asks Arizona Wilder, in your experience being brought up in this Illuminati environment, were you ever told anything about where these reptilians came from and what is the history of it all? And she says, 
I was made to learn through Mothers of Darkness, which is a certain aspect of the organization, because it was an early, early part of my training, the history of what was the Illuminati on this planet. And what I learned was that the Aryans were originally from Mars, and the reptilians came to that planet. They came from another place. They came to that planet to rule. They wanted to mix, and so they said with that race, but they became the overlords. And the Martians or Aryans were seeking to escape from it. They went to the moon, and then they were attacked and then they went to the earth and established culture here on earth approximately 6,000 years ago. And at that point in time, they were doing well and they were mixing with the indigenous population of this earth. They were getting along and then about 4,000 years ago, the reptilians arrived here and again began to take over. And they installed themselves in various places underground in the earth and also this one part of them, the ruling part, took over and became involved in the politics and in the religion and started controlling through these means, um, infiltrating into that and becoming that, and blood rituals started happening. And since that time, that is the way it has been. Uh, and so I wanted to get you to comment on, well, not only this, you know, this particular passage, but also, the Genesis 3, the Nakash, and the Revelation 12, the assertion that Satan, uh, Lucifer, you know, Satan the adversary, that he is this dragon-like entity, uh, the, a mm -hmm. winged snake or a feathered serpent. Right, right. Well, lots there. Um, certainly in the quotation that you just read, there are a lot of things that I would call speculation some things that i think coincides with uh david flynn's point of view that he talks about and that i reflect in in my book line wonders of the red planet uh that we've been talking about some tonight and um, and so there's some aspects of that um the, the the general theory is that this coincides or could coincide with what the bible talks about in terms of uh, in Genesis chapter 6, 4, where the sons of God came into the daughters of men and created a, a race known as the Nephilim, or Nephilim, and, uh, which really meant the fallen ones. And that uh, the Nephilim uh, were also known, uh, Moses, who I happen to believe wrote the book of Genesis, comments that these were the men of renown. And by that, even someone as, uh, as sort of conservative and intellectual as Francis Schaeffer suggests that that this is a reference to the Titans, the Olympians, to the mythologies of the world, and uh, it may be that the, the Nephilim were in fact sort of the the actual, um, I'd say, entities or humanoids, uh, but they were a hybrid race, and it was from that that our mythologies, our traditional mythologies of Zeus and so forth, that they were derived from. So uh, Flynn goes into the mystery religions of the Greeks and talks in more detail about the mystery religions of Canaan, uh, really beginning with, uh, with Babylon and, and Sumer, um, really moving to Canaan, the Canaanites. The Book of Enoch, which is a, you know, one of the questions I don't think I quite answered earlier, was about the pseudographical works, uh, the apocryphal works. And the Book of Enoch has been the one that's probably created the most controversy in the last five, six years, which is uh, a story that the watchers, there were 200 watchers that came down on Mount Hermon. And uh, in effect, the Book of Enoch was giving sort of a, an expanded amount of detail on uh, what Genesis 6-4 references regarding the sons of God, which is a veiled reference to angels, to angelic beings. And, um, you know, the, so the, the idea David Flynn talks about is, is it possible that, that Mars or a planet specifically that no longer exists, that is the, uh, that was blown up in um, perhaps six to 10,000 years ago, or perhaps even longer but that the uh, intelligent beings that existed there, that they did move to Earth and that they corrupted the Earth. There's, um, 
you know, there's some some reason to believe that. Uh, the, the couple of very obscure references in the Bible to Rahab. Uh, a friend of a friend of mine has written a book called The Rahab Conspiracy, which talks about this. This gets into the notion of a pre-Adamite race of beings that existed on Earth, um, and whether those pre-Adamite uh, intelligences were in fact the hybrid race. So there, there's a lot of different speculation on these things, and I, I find it really interesting. And I talk about it uh, a good amount. There was a scientist named Tom Flanders, who was uh, who's deceased a few years ago, but he was the head of the Naval Observatory, and he talked about the so-called exploding pa- planet hypothesis. And um, it goes back even to Kepler, I think, several hundred years ago, uh, essentially saying that where the asteroid belt is is where there should be a planet uh, approximately the size of Saturn that would would have existed between Mars and Jupiter. And it was this planet that exploded. And uh, Flynn talks about, Hoagland talks about uh, the exploding, exploding planet hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that Mars is actually a moon of this planet. And that when one studies the topographical sort of geographical features of the Martian surface, you'll see that one half of the surface is, is heavily cratered and the other half is not. And so, you know, Mars does rotate. And, uh, and so the question is, you know, well, how could one half of the surface be so cratered and the other half not? Well, the answer would be, well, that those craters were formed uh, in a very short window of time, perhaps within a few hours, uh, as opposed to like our moon, which has been cratered through, you know, not just millennia, but potentially millions of years, depending upon how un, how old one believes the the world is. And so the, uh, the there's evidence uh, that that Mars is more of a moon that lost its mother planet and got spun out into its own orbit. And uh, Phobos and Deimos, its two moons, are they're not really uh, you know symmetrical moons; they're sort of big rocks. And uh, they may have just been, in effect, asteroids that were captured by the gravitational pull of Mars. And so you've got um, some really interesting physical evidence to speculate on that. You get into Joseph P. Farah, who is a kind of a quasi-secular author, uh, has taught uh, even at at Oral Roberts University, but he was not... By no means a, a biblical literalist, uh, probably not even an Orthodox Christian uh, in in most any sense. But he uh, talks uh, favorably of Thomas Flanders and talks about the exploding planet hypothesis. He talks about the possibility of of a cosmic war and uh, points to the scarring of Mars, the uh, this this great big scar across the face of Mars known as Valles Marineris. Uh, the Mariner Valley, because it was discovered by the Mariner uh, Space Probe back in the 1960s. and um, But he speculates that there is a cosmic or has been a cosmic war. And uh, he has written a number of books, a, a book specifically called A Cosmic War, and talks about the uh, the evidence from looking at the text of ancient religions that, in fact, there's there's good evidence there that there was a cosmic war, uh, perhaps... Uh, a million years ago, perhaps 10,000 years ago, it's not exactly clear when, but he argues that there was one and that this would explain what we observe, um, characteristic of the topology on the surface of Mars. And so it really makes for some interesting uh, reading, and I have done presentation on the subject of you know, is there, was there a pre-Adamite Earth? Was uh, there a race of, of intelligent beings on Earth prior to Adam and Eve? Believing, as I do, that I believe the world is old. Uh, it may be 4.5 billion years old, but that the uh, human race was a race created by God, uh, the biblical God, and that that occurred roughly 6,000 years ago. It might have been 10,000 years ago, uh, but it's uh, thousands of years, not millions of years. And uh, and so it, it the question is, you know, trying to reconcile 
the biblical account with this notion of a race that existed on Mars. And then back to the point of the reptilians, um, I was just listening earlier today to a recent program that uh, Chris Putnam and Tom Horn were on with Steve Quayle on uh, Hagman and Hagman talking about Chris and Tom's new book uh, on the path of the immortals. And they were talking about the, uh, the, in effect, the essence of the seraphim versus the cherubim. The seraphim were the sort of the blazing, fiery serpents and would probably give rise to the concept of dragons in, uh, in ancient cultures, certainly in China, but not just in China. You see it in Europe. It's, again, the drag, red dragon is on the heraldry of the, of, the, uh, of the king of England. And so there's, of course, these great myths of red dragons. And is that a reference to the seraphim? Um, Chris argues that it is, that uh, the King James Version originally, uh, in its version, it translates the seraphim as the fiery dragons. And uh, so, you know, Chris argues that the reptilians are, in fact, um, a race of, of perhaps derived from the, the uh, seraphim. Uh, Gary Stearman talks about this. Gary's, uh, um, uh, I consider, a scholar and talks about the, the notion that we look at Ezekiel uh, 28, we talk about the, the nature of what the Bible uh, expresses regarding Satan. Um, Lucifer as well, although the question about Lucifer and whether that's a proper name for Satan is another question. But, but anyway, that the uh, that Lucifer, that Satan, was a reptilian, in that uh, perhaps as the, a cherubim, he was the master of a reptilian kingdom. And it was perhaps a reptilian kingdom, which we know as, know as the, the dinosaurs, that existed. And that, that was the pre-Adamic race. So there's just all kinds of interesting theories about this. And it's not likely that this side of the parousia, parousia the coming of Christ, that we're likely to know the answer to these things. But they're, uh, they're fun to talk about and intriguing. And um, and I think you use the term the nakish, which is uh, if you could you you have studied this a bit more than I, uh, Zen. But I think that the uh, we're talking really about the the snake or the nakish that was in the garden, if I'm not right. mistaken. Uh-huh. Right. So uh, so anyway, so those are those are some of the issues associated with Mars, the exploding planet, the possibility of it being the home of an ancient race. And that that race may have migrated to Earth when its home planet was destroyed. And, you know, even the face on Mars uh, appears to resemble a cherubim if you have uh, an inclination to see it that way. And perhaps it was a uh, a monument to uh, Lucifer, (laughs) perhaps. Yeah, well, there seems to definitely be something to that area there on Mars and uh, I absolutely believe that um, you know there were previous civilizations and large megalithic structures, even with you know what we find as far as the connections to Glastonbury and Sil- mm-hmm. Silbury Hill and uh, the mm-hmm. Tholus and and so yeah, um, which brings me to another passage I wanted to share and then get your um, commentary on this from. Jeremiah, because uh, it's my opinion that this particular passage is also speaking about the destruction of, um, you know, the possibly a fallen angel, uh, angelic civilization could even be that of Mars or um, the Rahab or Tiamat or, you know, whatever right. you want to call it, but mm-hmm. where it says, uh, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void and the heavens and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. And so there's speculation that this is also connected to the destruction if, um, in fact, because uh, the Sumerian teachings talk about, um, and even the Enuma Elish speak about that the planet that was 
where the asteroid belt is now was once the Earth, and that it was called Tiamat or Rahab, and that um, being gutted by one of the moons of Nibiru, that it swapped orbits or however that happened with Mars and uh, the atmosphere was destroyed on Mars and that that's the um, the Genesis 1, 1, 1, 2, how the earth became null and void and that this was a judgment against the fallen angels for, you know, whatever they had done previously. And so um, there seems to be something to it and definitely that, you know, the asteroid belt uh, is a result of some great cataclysm sometime in our ancient past. And even the rings surrounding Saturn, uh, the dust uh, that creates the rings of not only Saturn, but, you know, the, there are rings of other planets that this is the debris field from that ancient cataclysm and so long ago. And so uh, your comment on that? Right. Yeah, I think that... <clears throat> the uh, the notion of Thomas J. Flanders and the, the exploding planet hypothesis is that there could have been a number of mechanisms uh, sort of astrophysically that could have been responsible. As I commented earlier, Joseph P. Farrell speculates that there was a cosmic war, that uh, perhaps even the pyramids of Giza may have been designed to be some sort of cosmic weapon. Um, system and that uh, there could have been that kind of war. Um, it's, um, of course, great speculation that scientists really would not necessarily all align on. It's it's interesting that Carl Sagan, back in the early 60s, co-wrote a book with a Russian scientist, and he uh, talks about the fact that he believes there there is something peculiar about Mars that I believe it's Phobos, that the moon Phobos is hollow, and uh, and it's even possible that uh, our moon is hollow, although there's an alternative theory about why it is that our moon rings when it's struck, uh, such as it was with one of uh, the, the Apollo spacecraft. Um, and, uh, and so Phobos, if it's truly hollow, and, and Sagan says that it is, that it says that it must be artificial, that there is not a natural way for Phobos to be hollow, and uh, you know, interesting. Uh, that let's see, who was the Neil Armstrong? Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin was number two. Buzz Aldrin talks about the monolith on Phobos and uh, talks about the fact that it's hollow, and and drops some hints that he speculates that uh, there's something very weird and peculiar and even artificial about uh, aspects of Mars. So. Um, you know, do I necessarily believe that Earth and Mars switch places? Not necessarily. I think there could be other, uh, as I said, sort of geophysical, astrophysical explanations for what might have happened. But I'm not not a scientist. Just from the reading and the research I've done, that uh, you don't have to go to to that kind of explanation to posit the possibility that there were intelligences on Mars at some time, that there seems to be uh, not completely compelling but somewhat compelling photographic evidence, from at least from my vantage point, that um, you know there, there look like there are artifacts. I've got in one of my presentations some photographs that really cause you to scratch your head to say, Wow, you know, how could that have been an artificial, or excuse me, a natural structure on the planet Mars? Um, and so uh, the the again the planet, the you know the asteroid belt, all that sort of says something happened. And yes, it it does tie into the notion of what's known as the gap theory, Genesis one one, Genesis one two, that there there was uh, a chaos. The verse you read earlier was from Jeremiah four, chapter yeah, chapter four, verses twenty three through twenty six, and uh, in Hebrew the the language is tohu va bohu, uh, without form and void. And the way that it probably is more appropriately translated is that the earth became without form or void, right. and uh, and so yeah, I I you know as I said I believe and have even debated that that the earth is old but that something cataclysmic happened the earth was inundated with water and uh, the speculation is that this great planet 
uh, was on its surface uh, inundated with water, covered with water, that it appears that Mars was, uh, when this planet blew up, that Mars was uh, smashed with a great water bath. Right. Mars was at one time covered with an ocean that was perhaps something like four, five, six feet deep. And, uh, but Mars was so, uh, such a light amount of gravity that it literally couldn't hold its water. And so the, the water eventually evaporated, dissipated, and most of the water, uh, you know, basically left Mars. Mars still has some snowfall, we've discovered, still has some, um, you know, some moisture in the atmosphere, but not necessarily enough to sustain life as we know it. Um, so, uh, you know, so there's a lot of interesting things and I, I do believe that there are two floods talked about in the Bible. I believe that the, the Noatic flood was the second flood, the first hey, flood. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to let you know, we've got two minutes remaining and I wanted to give you a chance to, oh, um, yeah. give out your website and your contact information and yes. everything again, and then final commentary. Yeah. Uh, again, my website is faith-happens.com. Uh, you can find me, do a search on DougWoodward.com. You can find me on Amazon, S, as in Stephen, S. Douglas Woodward, and all of my books. Um, you can find this book we've talked about, Line Wonders uh, of the Red Planet, which I think if you're interested in these topics, you'll enjoy the book. It covers these and many other topics that we haven't even talked about. <coughs> and so I'd encourage your listeners to, uh, to take a look at that. The books are available in Kindle as well as printed. And um, let's see, in terms of, of last comments, just to finish up the last point, um, it really gets into the question of creationism and uh, an alternative point of view other than a young earth, and, and it's a point of view that, that I hold. And it sounds like you might as well, Zen. Yes, I, I do, absolutely. And I want to thank you, uh, Douglas, for making yourself available. And uh, if you would, join us again at some other future day. Well, I'd be pleased to. Thank you so much. All right. God bless all. Good night. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. Pick it up next week. Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here at freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio, and we will be broadcasting live for the next two hours here on Studio B. And I thank all of you for taking the time to join us and fellowship this evening. I have a very interesting, intriguing, and exciting guest um, joining me for the next two hours. S. Douglas Woodward, and he's published uh, five books, I believe, up until this point, and um, is busy with many projects and endeavors. And um, I'm really intrigued by the the newest book, of uh, which we will be focused on. But we'll, I'll get him to talk about each one of them, um, as they are all uh, connected to what we are dealing with as world and as the fig tree generation. Uh, important as far as revelation for preparing yourself and your families, your loved ones, for those things that are coming upon the world. Um, you can find his information and the different books and trailers and things that are connected to him, his blogs and his books, all found at faithhappens.com. Uh, Douglas. But then if they'd like me to sign those books, um, that is a way to do that uh, through Amazon. Uh, all my books are on Kindle and on iBooks, on Lulu, and on Nook. And so there's electronic copies of, uh, of all of them as well. Uh, excellent. Well, how I know that you were involved and have been part of 
uh, Microsoft and were involved with you know technology mm -hmm. and and <clears throat> things of that nature. But have you always had an interest in the prophetic word and study of mythology? How is it that you came to be an author? Um, kind of. <coughs> Right. Well, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a young man of 60 years old, um, and I've been, uh, uh, I would say, uh, in the fold, um, accepted Christ in my life probably when I was about 10 years old. Um, I'm, I'm one of those guys that listen to Billy Graham on television, and uh, as a child, uh, that made sense to me to invite Christ in my life, and so I became a, a Christian a long time ago. When I was 15, I had a, uh, a really nasty bout of cancer. I had a disease called rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, rhabdo is it sometimes shortened. And uh, it is a type of cancer that strikes adolescence. Again, I was 15 when this occurred. Ultimately, um, I lost my left leg to the disease. But uh, after lots of uh, radiation therapy, some chemotherapy and so forth, uh, managed to pull through. It also helped that I had people praying for me all over the country um, and uh, I struck up relationships with lots of different people. And uh, But somehow, uh, I think because the Lord had a plan for me uh, that extended beyond just having cancer, that I managed to get through that. So I, I definitely believe that uh, that the Lord's hand was on me. And, um, and so uh, that was back in the year 1969. And um, and so, uh, really, I, I got into. I thought I was going to go into the ministry, but it, things just didn't kind kind of work out that way. I got into uh, computers, and uh, after a number of years, I eventually worked for Oracle. Uh, I worked for Microsoft. Uh, it was a son that's uh, 31 years old, and I finally have a, uh, a grandson. Uh, his name's Brody, and. He is a uh, delight, and uh, so I've, I've kind of graduated from having just grand dogs to actually having a grandchild, <laughs> and so I'm I'm pretty excited about that. A big step up there. Yeah, a big a big step up. Not <laughs> not even close. So uh, so that's a little bit about myself. My wife Donna is a nurse, and and uh, again we've been married for almost forty years. So it's been uh, it's been I've been very privileged. I've worked for some great companies and and uh, develop a lot of great relationships and, and uh, very plugged into the, the sort of the prophetic community of the writer, researchers, and speakers. And, and I'm really privileged to interact with a lot of folks. And, and uh, so that's kind of my story. Well, that sounds like a quite an intriguing life. Um, I, I don't know if you know anything as far as my particular story, too, but uh, I acquired a disability when I was 24 years old, and I've been in a wheelchair since, and that um, ever since that time, I've had a lot of space and time um, to put forth and place my focus on study of the Word and mythology, ancient mysteries, and uh, mm -hmm. to have really digested and to have um, been diligent in my research and whereas you know most people are so busy so consumed as far as just trying to uh, manage their daily lives and pay you know make the money to pay their bills and to keep food on the table and so a lot and of course that has been done in such a way to keep most people occupied so that they can't place their um, focus and their priority on the kingdom and right. that the matrix has been instilled in such a way to um, to keep um, you know the majority of the masses their focus off of God and uh, mm -hmm. creator and creation and those things which are truly revel uh, relevant for you know our eternal our inheritance and our are you with us brother Hey, I am. <clears throat> it's great to be with you, Zen. Thanks for having me on. Uh, well, we appreciate you and taking the time to, to join us. And uh, as I said, I'm really intrigued by um, the last book that you are... I, I, I believe you've already published it, right? And it is available? That's right. Now, I've actually written about nine books. This one is one okay, that I great. wrote uh, and published oh, a year or so ago. And... Uh, 
but it's one that continues to draw a lot of attention and and uh, and based upon our discussions and and uh, understanding of your audience, it seems like it might be one of the ones that would be the most interesting to folks. And so um, I think it's where we where we should begin definitely. Uh, absolutely. Um, and before we go into that, if you would um, provide just your contact information, if people were mm -hmm. to want a, you know, a Facebook or email address, anything of right. that nature. Yeah, I know that's... your website and all, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and then also please um, speak about each one of your nine books as far as uh, what you know, just general discussion, what they are about. Sure. Sure. No, I'd be, I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Right. All right. Uh, basic contact information. My website is uh, Faith Happens, F A I T H hyphen Happens, faithhappens.com. And um, my uh, web or my Facebook site is S, as in Stephen, S Douglas Woodward. And uh, you can also reach me uh, through an email, which is Faith. You can just use Doug at faith happens dot com. That is uh, a good way to get a hold of me, and I, I'm pretty good about responding to emails. So I'd encourage your listeners to uh, feel free to ask me questions, and, and I'll do my best to get back to them here pretty quick. Um, and so, uh, so those are the different ways. You can also just search for me. Uh, you can do a search on DougWoodward dot com. It'll take you to my website if uh, all else fails and you can't remember if faith happens, then DougWoodward.com will get you there. And uh, you can find my books uh, at Amazon, uh, S. Douglas Woodward. There's an S. Douglas Woodward store. Uh, any of the books that I've written that folks are interested in, I was uh, general managers for both Oracle and Microsoft. I was a partner at the large accounting firm of Ernst & Young. So I've been in business most of my career. About six years ago, five or six years ago, I started writing books. I'd studied uh, Bible prophecy. I started to say uh, I was another uh, one of those guys that was uh, captivated by in about 1970 when Hal Lindsey released the book uh, Late Great Planet Earth. That had a big influence on my life. It kind of suggested to me that history was going somewhere. And, uh, and so I, I got very interested in prophecy and the prophetic word. Uh, at that time, so I've read, you know, not just dozens, but probably a hundred books on uh, prophetic subjects through the years, as well as just studying the scripture and participating as uh, was an elder and was an associate pastor at a Methodist church for a little while before I really got into computers and uh, was an elder in the Presbyterian church, the Reformed church. And, um, but, you know, the bulk of my career really was in computers, software, internet, media, things like that. So, um, but it's in the, been in the last five or six years that I've written nine books and I've spoken at a number of conferences. I, I have appeared on television. There's quite a few. If you go out and look at YouTube and folks look under S. Douglas Woodward, they're going to see a lot of YouTubes. Uh, I've spoken on uh, at different conferences, the television show, Prophecy in the News, been on there quite a few times and uh, talked a lot about my books. So there's videos out there as well that people might like to like to look at if they, if they kind of are interested in the things that I've got to talk about. So that is another way people can get acquainted with me. Um, I uh, live in Oklahoma. I've been, I will be married next month for 40 years. Wow. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm real pleased. Thank you. Pleased about that. I have a daughter that's following in her father's footsteps. She's uh, about 36 years old, almost, and uh, is uh, at Microsoft and works there in Seattle. In fact, she's coming to visit me and has just gotten in town here just a little while ago. So after we get done talking together, I'm going to go see my daughter. She's staying over at my son's house, and so my, my second child is uh, 